Well, hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Sam. I am a student of the Bible and theology, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a writer, and my training involves biblical studies, theology, and biblical languages. Uh, we're going to jump back into James chapter 1. Yesterday, we um, talked about the authorship, the background information, historical context, some of the critical scholarship, some of the rebuttal to the critical scholarship. We talked about um, what's kind of going on there. Um, and so we're going to jump, and we just used James chapter 1. Um, verse 1 to kind of set up where we're going. Um, today I just want to go verses 2 to 4, okay? Um, just three verses here, but I think there's a lot packed into these verses that are really awesome. Uh, I'm going to use the um, NRSV. I'm going to go back up to verse 1, kind of pick up the, the authorship and all that kind of stuff, and then I want to go all the way through. I want to show you something too. I'm going to use my... Um, my new Oxford annotated Bible college edition that I used back in um, 98 and 99 when I was in my first year of my first undergrad that I was going to, and we had to use this for our classes. Um, and this is the, uh, so this is like, was done in 1994 is when this um, version of the new Oxford annotated Bible was done um, for college students. So it's, it was cheaper, that kind of stuff. There's been four more editions since then, or three more editions, I guess. We're on the fifth one now. I have that one in my office, so I didn't have that one available. But um, my point is what I want to show you is that um, when you you make decisions based upon the data points that you're seeing, it kind of you kind of then have to then make other decisions. Okay, so I want to show you what I mean by that. Uh, because the, the critical scholarship view of James is that James, the brother of Jesus, is not the author, um, that it was written later, um, after James had died, um, pseudo, you know, like a, a pseudo, pseudopigraphically, I think, pseudo, pseudopigraphically, that's the word, oh my goodness, that I was looking for, um, like later um, on, like maybe late first century, early to mid second century, maybe it was written um, using James's name and some of the, maybe the themes that they would have known about James's life. Um, so that would be kind of the, and the reason I, I laid out in the video yesterday, all the reasons why they would have um, done that. But um, what I'm, I've, I found interesting was that that is maybe you know, when this was done in 1994, uh, Bruce Metzger and his team were the ones who laid this one out in 94. Um, that may have been the dominating scholarly view of the book of James. <coughs> Sorry. Since then, which is bit that's 30 years ago, by the way, um, it's hard to believe <laughs> that it's been 30 years already. Um, but uh, that may have been the dominant view. But in the last 30 years, um, scholars have really kind of re-looked at a lot of this stuff and went, wait, hold on a second. Maybe this isn't exactly what's going on here. Maybe James, the brother of Jesus, really is the author. Maybe it is earlier. Maybe that's really talking about something else than what, you know. And so I'm going to show you what. Okay, so um, James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, capital D, greetings. Um, now, the, the dispersion with a capital D is more than likely referencing this whole idea of the, the diaspora or the, the um, Jews being taken out of their land and kind of dwelling outside of the land, outside of Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff. And that was a hundreds and hundreds of year kind of thing going on. You can look that up and you, I mean, I read paper after paper after paper about the diaspora, um, both in undergrad, graduate level, and just recently, past couple um, of days. Um, and it just, it was a long period of time that kind of, they would just kind of use, um, and, uh, there was very specific parts of it, but it was kind of like, you know, this is what happens when they're all dispersed out. And, um, when you don't have, so here's what I found, found interesting. When you don't have James, the brother of Jesus as the author, when you don't have it early on this book earlier, when you have it later after he's you know been martyred and all this stuff, then you have to like begin to, you, if those are your data points, then you have to begin to also make other choices. And so the choice they make in the footnote about the dispersion is interesting in this, um, in this uh, Bible. It says, um, the dispersion describes Jews scattered outside of Palestine, which we all kind of know. Um, it's metaphorical use here 
testifies to the church's sense of being aliens in this world as well as the heir of Israel. Okay, so that's a that's a choice that they, they made, and it's likely the choice they made because they are um, attributing the authorship to someone later after James, after this whole thing. Now, as we discussed yesterday, if if that's not what it's what's uh, being talked about here, if James, the brother of Jesus, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, is actually trying to talk to Jewish Christians early on in what we call the dispersion, which happened in um, in Acts chapter eight. When you look at that, like they're being dispersed all over the place because of heavy persecution, um, because of Saul hasn't become Paul yet, and he's chasing down Christians, and, all, and they're just out scattered. And then you have like maybe this book of James written earlier on, anywhere between like 48 to 51, 52, somewhere around there. Um, then some of this stuff actually begins to make a little more sense. And you don't have to metaphorically use this idea of dispersion. You can actually kind of go, oh, well, I think who he's talking to here is the 12 tribes, the the Jewish Christians that would have been normally there, but now they're dispersed all over the place because of heavy persecution. Um, And so that's another way to read it. And I think for me, as I look at this, I think that literally makes more sense to me that James would be earlier on. This was actually who the author is that we're talking about here. Um, and actually, it's going to make a lot of sense, especially if you think about what was going on. 50 AD, there's a fam- a heavy famine that hits Jerusalem. And there's a lot of poor people, um, a lot of people who you know just can't um, build any kind of wealth. They don't have food. They're looking all over the place for food. There's people who do have and maybe taking advantage of some of the people who don't have and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so there's persecution going on from without. There's famine going on from within. There's a lot of problems going on here. And so all of a sudden with that as like a backdrop, James writes to these people and calls them his brothers and sisters. And so this is what it says in the NRSV. Then we're going to jump to the Greek because I think there's some really interesting and great stuff going on in the Greek here. It says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, this is the NRSV. Um, I forget when this update was, but it's not the UE, okay? Um, so let's let's run over to the Greek. I want to kind of look at some of the, the Greek here. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to point out some words here in the Greek that are really um, important for us to know. So, uh, the first one is in verse 2 where it says, um, you know, consider it joy or uh, consider it nothing but joy. Um, the Greek here actually says um, uh, uh, to uh, render it or to consider it um, joy, karan, um, when you, uh, and then the word here is uh Pirasmis, okay, and uh, I'll put that word somewhere here so you can kind of see how it looks in Greek. Um, and that word means trials, but it also means calamities or afflictions. I actually like calamities or afflictions. Trials makes it seem kind of trivial, um, but I don't think that's what um, James is going for here. I think it's really calamities, afflictions, when these things that are heavy, that are hard. Um, and then it says uh, when when they peri. Uh, uh, peripesite, which means that you you fall into them or they happen to you know it happens to you. Um, these are not consequences of you making bad choices and bad decisions. That's not why the bad stuff's happening to you. This is just like when stuff happens, when calamities and afflictions just you fall into them or when they they fall on you when this stuff happens. Um, and then it says. Um, uh, pikilis, okay, and that word means various or different kinds. When all any kind of these different kinds of calamities or afflictions that you just you fall into, they just things happen in life when they when they fall on you. James says, "I want you in the midst of that to consider it pure joy." Now, uh, here's what James is not saying. James is not saying, "I want you to be happy about what you're going through." I want you to be happy about the fact that um, life is hard right now. I want you to be happy about this really tough situation that all of a sudden feels like it fell on you or that you fell into. You didn't do anything to deserve it. It just happens. Like it's not fair that it happened. It just happens. Um, and he's like, I don't want, it's not, it's not that you should be happy about that, but uh, 
as we look at the outcome of this, we should be joyful about what is going to what, what's what the result of this thing is going to be in our growth. That's what James is trying to get at here. He's trying to say, listen, the reason we should consider it um, nothing but joy is because something good is going to grow in us because of it. Um, and so he says, uh, you know, going on, he says, uh, because you know, because we know that um, the, the testing or the trying of your faith produces, and then he uses the word upomonen, which means um, endurance, perseverance, or patience, okay? Uh, that's a very important Greek word, upomonen, and we're going to talk about that in a second, okay? It comes from the, the Greek word upomone, um, and it, that actually breaks down into a couple other words that actually help us understand what this word means, okay? Uh, then you go into the next the next verse, it says, and let endurance... Um, work, uh, let it uh, have its perfect work, uh, that you may be perfect and uh, finished or complete and in nothing fall short. Uh, and so uh, when we look at this whole idea of um, endurance, I think this is at these, these verses two, three, and four, there's this major theme about when you go through different calamities or afflictions or they fall on you or you fall into them. Um, one of the things that we need to allow to work is perseverance and, and endurance here. Okay. So um, in the Greek language, there's actually two words that we use for this idea of uh, perseverance, endurance, patience. Um, it's translated forbearance sometimes in the NIV. It's translated um, long-suffering in the King James um, at different times. There's two different words for the, this concept. Um, there's the word that James uses here, upomone, um, and then there's the word makrothumia. Okay, and uh, macrothumia is like when we use the in Galatians five, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance. NIV, NIV says um, that's the word macrothumia. And in fact, James uses hupomone here or upomone here. Hupomone is the Erasmus. Um, upomone here, but he uses um, macrothumia later in chapter five. And when we get to chapter five, you'll see how. Um, he's going to use both word pictures here and both words to kind of take us down a different path to help us understand these different kinds of endurance and perseverance and patience, okay? But where are they, what are these two words? What's the word picture that surrounds them, okay? So upomone um, comes from two Greek words mashed together into one, okay? So uh, the word upo, which means under or underneath, and then mone, which means to, to stay or to stand or to stand up or to abide in. And when Jesus says in John 15, abide in me, um, he uses the word mone and it, or a, a form of the word mone. And uh, it means to, to abide, to stand, to stay in. Um, and so this idea, the, this kind of word picture that upamone um, kind of conveys is this idea of standing up underneath or staying underneath or abiding underneath. And it's this idea of there's this weight that's on your shoulders and that um, if we're going to uh, endure it, if we're going to persevere through it, we need to stand up underneath it, stay underneath it. Um, and that's this, this idea that, you know, the longer you stay underneath it, the more you'll be able to stay underneath it. Um, when I uh, when I was just out of college, um, a group of uh, buddies uh, and I went to Canada, and we went um, we went canoeing, we went on a canoe trip, and we were going to go um, uh, canoe a bunch of lakes, and then we were going to uh, have a camp, you know, and go camping there for a week, and then we were going to come back. Um, and so we would canoe the lakes together, and then there were these. Um, trails that we had to stop and we had to go that connected the lakes and we would have to portage our canoes all the way across um, to the other side to the other lake some of those were really long um, sometimes if they're you know the canoe is big enough it would take two people to portage it. they have these yokes that go across and you put them on your shoulders and walk um, and uh, for the most part though for us it was just one um, one yoke one you know one person per canoe and it was my turn to portage one of them. And it was a pretty long portage. 
And so I, I put it up on my shoulders and I started carrying it. I've never done this before in my life. And it was heavier than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I, I remember I was like tipping it back like this. And I was, I was trying to rest it because it was hurting my neck. It was really heavy. And one of my buddies was like, hey, don't do that. And I said, why not? He goes, because it's going to make it even worse. It's going to make it heavier. What you need to do is you need to stay up in the middle underneath it, underneath the weight distributed and just let the weight sit on your shoulders and carry it that way. And so I did. And it was hard. It hurt. It was really heavy. Uh, but you know what was fascinating about it? We, we did all the portaging. We, you know, we camped that whole week. And then as we were coming back, it felt lighter. It felt easier to do. And the reason was because I was used to it. I knew what I was doing now because I had stayed up underneath the weight for long enough. And now my body was used to staying up underneath that weight. And I think that's the, the word picture that Upamone really you know wants to draw for us is that when we stay up underneath it and we allow that to kind of work and we allow that staying up underneath the weight to work, that we become more resilient. We become more, we become stronger. We become you know, perfected, completed, you know, whatever, because we will, won't lack anything because we'll be, we'll be, it'll, something will be working in us to make us stronger because of staying up underneath the weight. That's this word picture of upamone. The other, the other word is macrothemia. And that word comes from two words also. And it's uh, the word macros, which means long and the word thumos, which means um, uh, tempered or fired. Okay. So we get the word, uh, our word thermal from. And so when they put these two words together, it means long tempered or long fired. And this is the idea, this, this picture, this word picture of like a sword. When you, when you put it in, you temper a sword. The tempering process is there to, to you know, to, to get all the uh, impurities out of the sword. Um, so it can be um, more, uh, it can be more flexible actually. Um, that's what this tempering process does. And I remember watching my, my son, my older son, um, he loves Japanese culture. He loves swords. He's got tons of them. He's loves that kind of stuff. And we used to watch this show called forged in fire. And uh, I learned about this whole tempering process by watching this show. They would put it in the fire and they would temper, you know, then the longer they tempered it, the more impurities came out and the more impurities came out, the less brittle the sword or the knife or whatever it was, was because, um, it was tempered well, and so it wouldn't break, it wouldn't crack on impact and that kind of stuff. It would bend and it wouldn't break. And so that's what long tempering something does. It, it helps, the tempering process helps the metal to be less brittle. Well, if you think about that from this, this vantage point um, of like, okay, so uh, this idea of long uh, tempered, um, you know, as it relates to endurance and patience, macrothemia, like... It's this idea of the longer I allow myself in the heat, in the fire, the more tempered I'll become, the less brittle I will be because of it, and the more I'll be able to bend and not break when I run up into things. Okay, so that's a different kind of word picture than staying up underneath the weight of something so that my, you know, I can be stronger so that the, you know, the, the more this weight comes on, the, the easier it is to handle because now I'm strong enough to handle it. Right. And so this picture that James is trying to draw here of, you know, these calamities or these afflictions that we fall into or that fall on us of various different kinds, we should, we should consider the process of upomone joy. That's the, the joy is the endurance that we build because of it, not because it happened to us, not because we're going through it. And I got to tell you, I, I think I shared this before my, uh, a couple years ago, my daughter went through some pretty significant health scare, um, issues. And it was one of the hardest things our family ever went through. It was one of the hardest things I ever went through. And I got to tell you, I wasn't sitting in that, in the hospital going, you know what? I'm considering this joy. Um, I can look back now after the fact and go, wow, um, I've grown a lot and I'm more resilient now and I'm stronger because I didn't run out or run away from it. And I didn't kind of let it break me, but I was able to like, just stay in it and go, okay, I don't know why this is happening and it really sucks that it's happening, but, um, I think, uh, I'm going to allow this to make me more, uh, allow, allow, allow this to work on me. 
and I got to, I'm, I'm a, I'm a stronger person because of going through it. It sucks that we had to go through it. There's, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And anybody else who goes through it, I'm never going to look them in the eye and go, you know what? God's using this to build you and just test you. And then, you know, something good is going to come out of it. Like I would never say that to somebody else. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, this is terrible. This is awful. Uh, this is not fair. You got to go through this. Um, and it, it really, is, it stinks that this is something that we have to go through or that you have to go through. Um, and I would wait till the back end to, to see what was going on, you know, afterwards. And, you know, hindsight is always the time where you can talk about Upamone, where you can say, wow, but look how, how we've grown now. Look how strong we are now because of um, what we were, what we went through. Um, and it's, it's something that I think James is trying to point to that the joy is not in the midst of having to go through it. The joy isn't the thing. The joy isn't the circumstance. The joy is when we go through it and we build endurance, we can look back with joy and going, you know what? I'm, I'm a different person today um, and maybe a stronger person today because of having to go through something like that. I think that's what James is trying to get out here with, the, with these people and they're dispersed and they're being persecuted and this famine's going on. And he's like, he's like you know, um, as you go through this, um, it's going to build strength in it, strength in you, build character in you. It's going to build your faith up. It's either, this is either going to do one or two things to you. Anytime we go through trials, calamities, afflictions that fall on us, like one or two things is going to happen to our faith. It's either going to break our faith or it's going to build our faith. And James is trying to lean in and say, let it build your faith. Let, let the endurance do its perfect work in you so that it builds your faith so you'll be complete and you won't be lacking anything. And I think that's the point of what he's trying to say here. And he's going to go on in verse 5 to say, yeah, and if, if you're trying to figure out how, how to make this work, there's something you can ask God for that um, he wants to supply for you. Okay, but we'll get to that in the next video. Um, so yeah, we'll just stop there and we'll jump in uh, in verse 5 in the next video. Thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.